Okay, guys, so this is our, I believe, third session on uh, Plato's Republic. And um, so let's just recap, okay? Um, we, we had talked about how uh, basically what, what, what we are trying to imagine is uh, uh, Plato basically in trying to assess the extent to which Plato's um, Republic as a, uh, as a political project and uh, in terms of its underlying philosophy, the extent to which um, we can appreciate or try to understand what exactly he's trying to get at. And we talked about how this is very much relevant uh, for our modern predicament, precisely because um, Plato is not, this is not a historical text in the sense that it's dealing with uh, Plato is not, does not think of himself as dealing with a certain historical context per se, but he is trying to address the nature of politics as such, right, and certain elements uh, in the human condition. Now, we also talked about how uh, the, the, the relationship between what we call politics and what we call philosophy and the notion that philosophy and politics are essentially always in a kind of dialectical relationship and that um, a lot of the philosophies that we now have are really the product of actually political deliberations and, and political issues. And this is not difficult to understand, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the question of, of political philosophy and ethics and morality, these questions are, are really only relevant, right? When we encounter the other, when we are in a, in, in a relationship and when are we in relationships, right? When, when do we encounter the other? When do we begin to ask questions of authority, legitimacy? Obviously, when we are in the social space, right? When we are in the political space, um, broadly speaking. So, so it's important that as we read the text, we do not think of, you know, uh, political philosophy or Plato as speaking from some sort of academy or uh, some sort of you know ivory tower or or uh, or from behind a desk, right? Plato is speaking from within a political space, and he is trying to address something as foundational as the human condition. And for Plato, the human condition does not change, right? The human condition uh, uh, has its own essence, and thus he has in mind that this text would essentially be we. I mean, one can argue it would be relevant to all of the, uh, to, to, to all ages. Now, of course, I mean, this is somewhat of a disputed question. Um, and it's not because it's disputed, not because Plato thinks that, you know, uh, there are different types of human essences or human natures, but because at the time, right, um, Plato was thinking about the city-state, right? He was not thinking about, for example, a, a, a federal republic, let's say that as big as the United States or as big as Russia, right? Um, or a union that is big as Europe. He was thinking about a city-state and naturally in a city-state, uh, you know, relationships are far more compact and uh, homogenous and uh, intimate. So later on, you know, after the, the uh, after Plato and Aristotle, the, the debate actually shifts, not so much about democracy versus the Republic, but as the, 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 the state begins to expand into Macedonia and, and you know, the, the epic, the, the era of, of Alexander the Great and so forth, obviously the city state goes from the, the polis, the, the state that, uh, the compact state that Plato is, is thinking about expands drastically. And then this of course raises new, new political questions, but this is not the topic of our, uh, our lectures. What we are interested in is debates that are occurring within the city state. And the current debate is that we have the, the question of democracy and on one hand, and on the other hand, we have the question of the Republic and uh, essentially, the, we, we said earlier that the, 
the the Plato's problem with uh, with the idea of, of of democracy is that it is fundamentally unstable. Why is it unstable? Because there are competing interests, and that the the average individual is not really is not a you know um, rational being that uh, can you know uh, uh, basically leave his interests at in the private realm, you know, at the door of his house when he engages in politics. Um, humans have different degrees of intellect and usually what will uh, influence their decisions are their own interests and so forth. And so this creates the possibility in the view of Aristotle that the majority can always be influenced, right? And that it can, the state can essentially fall back into a totalitarian state. Uh, a dictatorship and so forth. So here Plato is saying, okay, then we need to think of a new schema, a new way of dividing people, right? So in the same way that in a democracy, people are divided between the major majority and the minority. Plato is saying, look, we need a different type of hierarchy. We need a different type of differentiation. And the, the power of his argument is that he states that how do we that we divide people and that we we create classes not on the basis of the arbitrary will of a king or what people are on people's interests, but we do so according to nature. We do so according to nature. Now this is somewhat of a uh, profound statement because. When we, when we say that we ought to divide people according to their nature, okay, and according to the structure of reality, right? This is a shift from the, the ideas of Sophocles and Homer, wherein we didn't have an idea of nature as being ordered, right? And if it was ordered, it was not a transparent order. So here, Plato is trying to tell us that, look, there is an order to the world, and that, and there is a nature to the world, and man has a fixed nature. Uh, therefore, these divisions should be according to what is natural, what is just. So this brings us to what Socrates will go on to argue. He will argue that, uh, of course, Plato is speaking to us through, through Socrates that when we think of justice. Okay, and I'll get to this in, in more detail. We cannot think of justice as a sort of idea or an object that kind of exists somewhere outside of the self. But rather, we should think of justice as conforming to an order in terms of being in harmony with an order that already exists within us and out of us. So this justice is essentially to be in harmony with nature, not to try to dominate nature, not to try to conquer nature, and not just to know the laws of nature, but the, 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 the laws of man and the relationships of man that are based on free will and, and subjectivity should conform to the types of laws and order that structure our world and structure our reality. And uh, uh, the the philosophical basis for this uh, argument is that, you know, the question that can be posed is that, well, where does this order come from, right? We said in uh, last week that this order is essentially an objective and real order, right? It is not an abstraction, but it is real insofar as it exists in a world of idea, in the realm of ideas, right? And that our world is essentially a reflection of that set of ideas and the order therein, and that our objective should be approx to, to approximate and to try to conform to that, those ideas as much as possible. Again, those ideas forming a total um, order. So the, the, what, what this essentially means, okay, now if we can look at, at what might 
potentially be a negative, right, before we delve back into the text, that the question of political relationships and authority and legitimacy and roles and so forth is no longer a matter of public deliberation, right? The people do not gather to determine how they ought to relate to one another because how they ought to relate to one another is already dictated in the code of nature, right? In the very order that, that defines nature and, and uh, reality. So then the question, of course, that is posed is, uh, uh, you know, nowadays we can say is that where does this leave us in terms of a citizen engaging in political participation? Right, and where does this leave us in terms of our ability, for example, to get out of a particular political class and to try to enter a new political class? Right. So these are the sort of arguments that uh, uh, um, later centuries would pose against Plato's Republic, and the reason they did so is is because some elements within the Plato's Republic would actually be appropriated and used in some fascist models of governance, right? So for, for fascism, right, and for a totalitarian state, there is a single objective truth and that this truth is embodied in order and man ought to conform to that order. And who dictates to us what that order is? Well, it is the ruling party, right? The, the, the sovereign, um, the Fuhrer, and, and, and the chairperson um, you know, and so forth. So that's just something to keep in mind um, in terms of a possible critique um, as we proceed. And then we can, we can um, observe it in more detail later. Uh, one, one important thing to, to note, however, is that Plato would later on refine his ideas in um, his book called The Laws, right? You would try to bring these ideas a bit back down to earth and try to have a more um, inclusive account for what exactly is politics and how do we engage in politics and so forth. So now going back to the text, we left off where uh, Socrates is arguing that uh, justice is not only an objective truth, but justice is also that which brings about happiness. Now, this implies that there are two possible types of happiness. There is happiness that is of a higher sort, and there is happiness that is of a temporary and illusionary sort. So what Socrates is trying to get at in this text, if you, if you, if you read it carefully, is that, look, I mean, you, you, can, you can really think of it analogous to the body. The, if, if a person, for example, were to eat uh, a bunch of you know, detrimental goods, right? detrimental sweets and so forth, and the purpose of doing so is to fulfill a particular instinct, right? a uh, physical instinct, right? the desire for pleasure and so forth, then to what extent can we say that he has attained happiness? Given that, given that this act does not conform, right, to the proper order of his body, that does not conform to the proper order that makes up the human soul and so forth, right? The, the idea is that essentially what we eat ought to be in conformity to what is good for the body. Similarly, what we think ought to be good to what conform, ought to conform to what is good for the human soul, right? So yes, eating sweets, for example, or, or plundering wealth may bring about a sense of satisfaction, but this satisfaction is as short-lived as the desire itself, and desires do not last long. They end when you satisfy them. Whereas uh, contentment is permanent and stable because the elements that constitute our bodies and our soul are also stable and permanent. 
So Plato is saying, look, in order to understand what is happiness, first, we have to turn inwards and ask the question, who am I, right? What, what, what is the nature of man? And he recognizes that this is somewhat of a difficult question for, uh, for uh, the average dem citizen to think about. So he says, look, let's use a metaphor, okay? Let us raise the question of human nature um, to the question of the uh, city. So he says that the elements that make up a city are very similar, are identical to the elements that make up man. So man is kind of like a microcosm of the polis. And there are essentially three uh, elements that make up the soul and the city. The first is wisdom, the second is courage, and the third is temperance. So at the level of the, of, of the individual, wisdom refers to reason, right? Courage refers to temper, and temperance refers to our lower elements, right? Our physical disposition. At the level of, uh, at the level of uh, uh, the city, at the level of the polis, on the other hand, um, wisdom refers to the rulers, courage refers to the soldiers, and temperance belongs to, uh, you know, uh, the artisans and, and uh, uh, their obedience to the lower class. So Socrates then goes on to say that, listen, given that these are the three elements that make up man and they make up the city-state, Justice is the harmony between these three elements. And so he says in line 441, he says, each of us will be a just person fulfilling his proper function only if several parts of our souls fulfill theirs. Now, what does this mean? What do we mean, what do we mean by fulfill theirs? Plato will go on, uh, Socrates, again, Plato, will go on to say that, look, each human being is disposed towards and, and, and is born with a natural aptitude for one of these three elements. You will excel in either wisdom, courage, or temperance, okay? And so according to your natural aptitudes and your natural capabilities, which is to be wise, courageous, or temperance, some of us are more suited to be rulers, right, philosophers. Some of us are more suited to be soldiers. And some of us are more suited to be artisans. And uh, this is not really a radical idea, right? Even today, for example, we, 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 when you look at a child, we say, oh, he's going to grow up to be an artist. He's going to grow up to be a, a, a philosopher or professor. He's going to grow up to be a soldier and so forth, right? And, and, and you know how, like, in every group of friends, we have the, you know, the rough guy, the, the guy who would like climb the wall and, and we have the, the courageous guy. We have the, the smart guy who's like, you know, sitting in the corner and philosophizing with you. And we have the, you know, the creative person, you know, who has the bracelets and is like weird hair style or whatever. So, I mean, this is something that we kind of experience, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, um, but we don't really link it to the idea of politics. Plato wants us to link it to the idea of politics. Right. And and as a surface value, this is some I mean, this is an appealing argument, right? It is an appealing argument and and any kind of response um, would, would essentially require trying to think through some sort of alternative. Right. So we don't have this modern idea of uh, equality and, and sameness. Right. Uh, this idea that the the polis is essentially a an aggregate of equal homogeneous individuals that are all the same, right? And uh, future uh, contemporary uh, defenders of Plato would act would would go on to argue that this idea of equality and um, this idea of uh, 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 sameness essentially produces a sense of mediocrity, 
right? That we are all essentially forced to conform to a certain sense of individuality. And uh, 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 so we, we replace diversity and order with equality. So it's kind of like a reduction of the differences that distinguish one individual from another, right? So one of the questions that we can think about is, well, okay, how do we embrace difference, right? Um, to promote creativity without essentially setting up hierarchy, right? Without setting up hierarchy. How do we live in a society, in the modern world, where the courage of the soldiers does not lead them to seize power? And for example, eliminate art, right? And this is, or, 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 wage a war against the arts and, 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 and the poets and the artisans and so forth. And again, these are questions that we saw unfolding, you know, whether it's today with the rise of populism and, and, and Trumpist politics, or at the time, you know, throughout the, 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 the very convulsed, uh, very um, tenuous history of Europe, where we had, again, the revival of certain platonic political ideas through fascism, you know, in Spain, Italy, uh, 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 Germany, and other places. Um, and of course, to a large extent in, in, um, in the Muslim world as well, uh, in, in you know, the, the works of some Muslim philosophers and trying to uh, 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 relate the idea of the philosopher king to uh, the caliph, the khalifa, and, and so forth. So now, Socrates recognizes that there are also three types of human, right? Given that each one of us is predisposed to one of these three elements, um, there are three types of human beings, okay? And this is how he responds to our question, um, the question of, well, why shouldn't everyone be equal? Why, why shouldn't we think of a universal type of man, right, individual, an idea of sameness. So Plato, uh, Socrates responds by saying, look, if we were to examine any particular society, we would recognize that there are three types of men. The avaricious man, the man who will praise the life of business, that is pleasure and material benefit. There is the ambitious man, who will praise the political life, i.e. power and authority. And then there is the academic man who will praise knowledge and understanding. Now for Socrates, he says, he then poses the question, which of these three men is best suited for ruling? Which of these men should we have rule over us? So Socrates, is, I mean, you can think of this as a way of setting up the answers for the debate, right? Setting up the conclusions that we are supposed to reach at, right? And this is part of the Socratic dialogue. And this is one of the reasons that it's so influential. He says, okay, given that we have three types of men, who should we select as our king? He goes on to say, well, first, and uh, he says, obviously, that this should be the philosopher for two reasons, the academic man for two reasons. First, they have experience, insight, and reasoning. Second, the objectives pursued by the philosopher are more real than the illusions and the temporary nature of pleasure and power. And that the, the, the philosopher does not want to project onto the polity, onto the Republic, his or her own personal interests. But given that he has the capacity to discover truth, he will ensure that society as a large also lives in accordance with the truth and that society's function is essentially to fulfill the truth by remaining um, uh, 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 committed to the order, i.e. being committed to justice, right? So the philosopher king kind of keeps everyone in his place by drawing our attention to what is the good, what is the just, and what should be the role of each particular individual. Now, another argument that, that Socrates gives is he says that, look, uh, 
how can we, I mean, this sounds nice in theory, right? This idea that the philosopher king has to rule, right? But what about the philosopher kings? What about the philosopher's need for other social functions, right? At the end of the day, philosopher also has, for example, he has to secure his own um, survival, right? And therefore he must at times engage in, in, in trade and business. Um, he must also uh, ensure his security, right? And so forth. So the argument that Socrates says, he says, look, it is only when the, those who are disposed towards courage and uh, temperance, when they fulfill the role, they give the philosopher the ability to dedicate themselves to the task of philosophy with no distractions and dedicate themselves to the task of ruling, right? Uh, and this is somewhat of a understandable idea, right? If, if the philosopher had to worry about, for example, uh, you know, making an income and, and um, you know, uh, setting up security around his house because of potential political instability, naturally he would not be able to devote himself to the task of philosophy and, and ruling. So another reason, one of the practical reasons why there must be order, i.e. just, why there must be order and harmony in the different uh, uh, classes of a society, which again are the rulers, soldiers, and artisans, is that it allows each person to fulfill his or her own, each class to fulfill its own function without any uh, disruptions or without any distractions. And I mean, what I find, you know, um, what, what I find, you know, in, in interesting here is that, or, or one of his powerful arguments is this idea of the, the politician, right? The ambitious man who, who desires uh, power and authority versus the academic man who pursues knowledge and understanding. And the reason I find this very interesting is that it's very relevant to, to the question, you know, that, that some of us pose, for example, today, right, in, in forming a government, um, that who should we select, right, to come into power? Who should we select for, you know, the new um, uh, government and, and, and or, or revolutionary coalition and so forth? And the reason that this is a complicated question and it's so divisive is because we all we all recognize that different individuals who are engaged in politics have certain interests right um uh so whether it is with is for example the 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 survival of their political party or whether it is the accumulation of wealth and so forth and so there's always this difficulty of who do we choose to rule over us, right? Now, what Socrates is saying is that, look, this question is only a problem if you limit yourself to a pool of politicians, right? And you're setting yourselves up for a problem precisely because by definition, that pool of people are people who are driven by the desire for power and the desire for authority. And so what if, Socrates says, that we shift ourselves to a new pool of people, the pool of people who do not desire power and do not desire authority, but desire the knowing the truth and, um, and, and, and wisdom, right? Those who are altruistic. Fair enough, this sounds like a very appealing idea and it sounds like somewhat of a good alternative, okay? But, I mean, I want you to think of, of, of your own, how you would critique this. Uh, but I think it's one of, I mean, one, one of the sufficient, one of the, 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 the initial responses might be, well, which philosopher do we choose, right? Um, we have philosophers that belong to different schools of thought. Um, so here, let me just throw around a few ideas, okay? 
um, before and and then and then uh, uh, later on we will we will go more into the division of classes. So if I were to come to you and say, okay, well, according to Socrates, we should draw on the pool of the philosophers. Well, the modern individual might ask, okay, that 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 sounds nice, but which philosopher? The Marxist philosopher, the liberal philosopher, the Islamic philosopher, the Thomas Christian philosopher, right? And how do we ensure that the philosopher is not uh, imposing onto us his interpretation of the truth, right? Something which is arbitrary, but that the philosopher has essentially understood truth in its objective form and that we are living under it. And how do we know that he has discovered the truth in its objective form if we are not philosophers? So Plato here recognizes that politics is more messy than theory might make it out to be, right? In theory, people would be like, yes, we need the philosopher king and the philosopher king knows what is true and what is best for us. In practice, a whole bundle of questions are opened up. So what happens when the, um, the, the ambitious class challenges the philosopher? What happens when the avaricious man, right, the, the businessman challenge the philosopher and they, do, they, 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 they posit these challenges, of course, because they have their own interests. How do we control these classes, right? If we cannot expect them to, to, to be naturally inclined towards justice and harmony, how do we ensure that they conform and that they are subjugated to the philosopher king? This is where politics, again, goes from theory back to the concrete and the real relationships between men. So notice Socrates first takes the question of politics to the level of, of, of theory, the level of the polis, and then he brings it back down. Then Plato will have to bring it back down to the questions of, okay, now what? How, do, how can we implement this in the real world? Right? How can we expect people to conform to the dictates and to the wishes of the, of the philosopher king? Now, uh, it's essential that, that you think about this and that uh, uh, th this will be kind of the question that I will um, be posing in your reflections, uh, namely, uh, to what extent does the theory hold out in practice, right? And what is lost in the theory when we try to implement it, the idea of the philosophy king, into the practical, political world, the world of real concrete relationships. So we will get to this on and, and more discussion on the classes in relation to the philosopher king um, next Tuesday. And next Tuesday, I will spell out what exactly the assignment for Plato will be. So I'll see you guys next week and enjoy your vacation, the short Thursday vacation.